Greetings and welcome. We're so glad you're here today with us. Welcome Free Methodist Church family and for those of you who are tuning in from around the country and around the world. Well, here we are, week 18 of this pandemic. And each day is still as uncertain as before. And we're weary and we wonder about the future. And yet, God is still God. He's not left us. He has not changed. And we have come together because we believe in God. We trust in God. We place our hope in God. Hear these words. Sing praises to God, O you saints, and give thanks to God's holy name. We exalt you, O God, for you have restored us to life. We may cry through the night, but your joy comes with the morning. You hear us, O God, and you are gracious in our distress. You turn our mourning into dancing. Our souls cannot be silent. O God, our Savior, we give thanks to you forever. Let's pray. Lord God, as I'm sitting here at the base of this huge tree, I'm reminded of your great and mighty creation. As I hear the breeze blowing through, as I look at the blue sky, as I think of all the beauty that you've created, it gives me hope. I pray for us, all who have gathered for this, that we would believe in you, that we would trust in you, that in you we would put our hope, and to be reminded that we are here through every battle, every heartbreak, every circumstance, and we believe you are our fortress. We worship you, O oh Lord our God. Give us rest, give us peace, fill us with your spirit, challenge and inspire us in this time. In your name, amen. Let's worship the Lord together. Yeah. 
The next song we're going to sing repeats the words, I believe you are the way, the truth, and the life. And that comes straight from John 14. After Jesus has resurrected from the dead and he's met with his disciples several times, this is one of his last teachings to them before he ascends to the Father. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And so, as we sing this song, let's think of it as a creed. That together we are proclaiming this belief that unifies us as disciples of Christ. For this is a summary of of everything that it means to be a disciple of Christ, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. So let's sing these words together.
set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you. Jesus, we believe that you are the way, and we ask right now that even though it feels so difficult to see a way forward or to even know what the future will bring, that we can trust you to provide a path for us. We believe you are the truth, and in a world where it can be so difficult to separate the truth from the lies, we ask that you would reveal your truth to us and give us the bravery to speak it. And Jesus, we believe you are the life. Many of our lives have been upended recently. We ask that you would give us new life and strength to live it by drawing close to us. And Jesus, you are our protector. Protect us from the evil, sickness, and fear in this world, and give us your peace so that we may bring that peace to others. Hello church, happy Sunday. We have a few announcements for you today. The first is just a reminder about our two opportunities for gathering on Sunday mornings apart from our home church service that's sent out at eight o'clock a.m. that you're watching right now. The first is our under the tent prayer time at 1045. This takes place in the upper parking lot and it's just a time to fellowship, pray, and listen to contemplative music. And if you would like to join, please RSVP in advance just so we have an idea with numbers. You can do this by visiting our website or looking out for an email on Fridays or Sunday mornings. The second is our online prayer and share time. This is similar to what we do under the tent, but is online on Zoom. So if you'd like to join that, the link to join can be found on our website and also on our Sunday email. If you would like an opportunity to pray throughout the week, we're continuing our midday prayer time, which is every weekday at 11.30 on Zoom. Each day, a different pastor will be available, and you can come and pray with them for anything that's going on, whether it's in your life or in the community or in our world. We know there's so much happening. So please join that. The link to join is on our website. FMCSB Summer Reads is continuing their reading through the book, Trouble I've Seen, Changing the Way the Church Views Racism. A few weeks ago, they had their first Zoom discussion on chapters one through three of the book. And on July 25th, there will be a second discussion on chapters four through six of the book. So if you would like to be a part of that, please read those chapters and come ready to ask questions, bring your thoughts and comments to the group. And the link to join can be found on our website. And if you would still like to be a part of that, even if you weren't a part of the first discussion, you can still join. Please email Pastor Nikki and she'll give you more information about that. It's been a while since we've given you an update on masks on a mission, but I talked to Shannon this week and she let me know that they've reached their goal of creating 3,500 masks for those in our community who are on the front line. And we're just so excited about this, so grateful to be a part of this ministry. If you've contributed financially, if you've donated materials or sewing things, or have even helped sew these masks. We're so grateful for you and for this ministry and the way 
that they've really um, given to our community during this challenging time. Lastly, Pastor Nikki is looking for people to be a part of the congregational care team. This is something that we talked about a while back when the pandemic first started, but it's become a need again in our community and in our church. So if you would like to help make phone calls, pray, or do grocery shopping for those who need extra help, um, this is a great way to do that. And right now, grocery shoppers are especially needed. So please contact Pastor Nikki if you would like to be a part of this or help in any way. For my senior seminar class at Westmont, we read a book called The Will of God as a Way of Life. And as someone who has a hard time making decisions big and small, this book was really helpful for me. Anytime I'd be faced with a decision, I'd be so caught up and so concerned with the outcome because I really wanted to be sure that it was in line with God's will for my life. But how do you know that? You don't really know that. That's, yeah, that's beyond what we could even know. But this book said it really plainly that God's will for our lives is to know him, to put him at the center. And when we do that, all of our decisions automatically fall into his will. So this was really helpful for me because I became less concerned with what the outcome of, of the decision would be and more concerned with my heart in making that decision. Was I putting God at the center? Was I thinking of him when I was making those decisions? So as we go into this time of reflection and thinking about how we might give, whether it's through finances or our time or our talents, let us look inwardly to our hearts and remember that that's what God sees. God is concerned with our hearts in those moments and not about the outcome of what we do. So let's just think about that as we reflect in this moment. Hey FM Kids, Pastor Jake here. Do you like stories? I think we all like stories. My daughter Sophie, this is one of her favorite stories, Ollie the Stomper. It's about a little duck who goes in search of rain boots. So that's one kind of a story, is just a story about a search for rain boots. But you know what my favorite kind of stories are? A stories about the ways God has worked in people's lives. Do you know that everyone you know has a story of their own? Your mom, your dad, your siblings, friends, even strangers at the park or the store. Each of them has their own story of their life. Well, today in our home church, we're gonna hear from four different people from our church and the stories of their life. And not just of their life, but the stories of, of God in their life and the things that, that God has done in their lives. And these are my favorite kind of stories. So I'm excited to hear them. And sometime, I hope I can hear your story. All right, well, that's all for now. See you later. As we enter into this time of prayer, we want to acknowledge the recent passing of Representative John Lewis and Reverend C.T. Vivian. Both men were pivotal to the civil rights movement, have been voices uh, where they have advocated for justice, mercy, truth, love. And in that legacy, I wanna invite us into a time of prayer where we can ask the Holy Spirit to inspire that same kind of conviction that we as a church at Free Methodist Church of Santa Barbara can leave that kind of legacy in our communities, especially in a time where we are confronting um, the evils of injustice and racism, of oppression, marginalization. And so in legacy of these men, um, please join me in this time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the ways that you used our brothers, John Lewis and C.T. Vivian, and the ways that you inspired them to be men of truth, conviction, and action. That they lived lives um, where they practiced both 
justice, mercy, truth, and peace. And in this time of prayer as a church, I ask that we sit in a time of silence where we can say, Lord, illuminate those same truths in our lives so that we may be living out your gospel day in and day out in our community as we advocate and say, Lord, bring light, bring truth as we seek to respect the dignity of every human being that we encounter, that we lay our lives for the good work of dismantling racism. So Father, let us sit in silence as we think of these two men, as we think about how you can empower us as a church to do the good work of advocacy and justice. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we say, Amen. Amen. Peter 3, we are exhorted to always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks for the reason why we have hope in Christ. Today, we have asked four people in our congregation to tell us why they have hope in Christ. They're going to give you their testimony. To give testimony is simply to be a witness of who Christ is and how it is that he has called us and what it is that he is actively doing in our lives. The people that we have asked are Christine Short, Donald Velasquez, Bob Perlis, and T.K. Erickson. And we are so grateful that they have prayerfully considered whether or not they would speak, and then they have chosen really carefully the words that they wanted to share with you, their church family. And so may the Lord be glorified this morning as we worship Him, as people tell us the experience that they have had of His saving grace. Good morning, Free Methodist Church family. I hope all of you are doing well during this difficult time of 2020. I was asked to give my testimony and so I am going to share that with you today. 
I did not grow up in a Christian home. I did grow up in a very loving home. I moved to El Centro, California in a cul-de-sac where I met a lovely family by the name of the Reds. Their daughter, Danita, was a year older than me and we became fast friends. She frequently asked me to church and I started to go with her and I went multiple times. And there was a particular time where we were sitting in a children's Bible study and they asked anybody if they'd like to ask Jesus in their heart. And that was the day that I did that. The place felt very safe and loving and um, it was very easy for me to do. And that was the day that um, I believed and I spent years praying, but I didn't have a personal relationship with the Lord. It wasn't until I was 31. I went out to a church uh, in Goleta, Goleta Covenant, and Dennis Wadley was teaching. And it was there I realized that you have to have a relationship with the Lord. And that's when my eyes were opened and I started reading my Bible. I started uh, Bible studies. I started growing and I learned that I needed to ask for forgiveness for those years of sin. Uh, I did many bad things that you shouldn't do, and I needed forgiveness. And that's when my life changed, but there was one difficult thing that was still in the way, and that was that my husband wasn't quite there yet. He was attending the church with me, but his heart wasn't quite there yet, and so it, it put a little strife in our marriage, and the Lord asked me to pray silently for him, so I spent a year praying silently for him. And then God was faithful and he came to the Lord and it was wonderful. We were able to uh, raise our children in the Lord, knowing the Lord, loving the Lord, and it changed our lives forever. I did have a friend who uh, had done something that was difficult and hard and it was actually one of the things that I had done that I needed forgiveness for her, and I was able to share the love of Christ with her and let her know that God forgives her and walk her through that and he took my bad and used it for good in that moment and that was incredible and I know that God places different people in my life and uses that often which has been a blessing three things that keep me close to the Lord. I love to worship and sing. When I am worshiping and singing, I feel the closest to God. I just feel his presence and there's nothing like it. When I read my Bible, I feel he frequently gently corrects me. And when I pray is when he changes my heart and prayer is powerful. And I'm forever grateful for the people he placed in my life that prayed for me and that got me here. I'm grateful for the people he places in my life that I get to love. I am happy and grateful that he changed the course of my children's life and ours forever. And that's about my story. Good morning, everyone. My name is Donald Velasquez. I have been a member at Free Methodist Church for the last three years. Thank you, Pastor Doug, for asking me to share this morning. My life as a Christian began when I was about nine years old. I went on a field trip with my Sunday school class. The teacher told us something like, if you want Jesus to come into your heart, you need to invite him to live with you. And so I did. If I think about that as the beginning of my Christian life, the thing that has been helping me to grow the most are together with the church, listen to worship music, and pray. The best part of my life as a Christian has been meeting my wife. We met at the church I was attending 14 years ago. Just the fact of having met her in church and getting to share the same faith is a huge blessing. There have been two very challenging events in my Christian life. The first has to do with really having faith in the person I had accepted as my Savior. About seven years ago, we learned 
the wonderful news that we were going to become parents, all on the joy in the expectation and seeing our little one grow was cut short when my daughter was born 15 weeks before her due date. When she was born, the doctor told us that she had 50-50% of chance of surviving. When I saw the incubator with all the machines that were helping her to stay alive, since she couldn't breathe or her own yet, I felt completely weak and helpless. I couldn't do anything to help her. The only hope I had was to ask God to allow her to live. The day passed and God showed his power and my faith grow. Today, when I see my daughter running, jumping, talking, and shouting, I see a true miracle and remember God's great power. With God, nothing is impossible. The second event that has challenged my faith was when I went through a very difficult situation a few years ago. This time, it had to do with forgiveness. For many years, I had heard that Jesus forgives sins. I had experienced his forgiveness in my life. For me, it was easy to say that God forgives my sins, that Jesus taught us to forgive others, and that we should love our enemies. While this is all very true, it becomes difficult when it is our own turn to forgive. It was a time when I have to practice what I believe. My character as a Christian was being challenged. The situation was becoming a very heavy burden to carry and I was consumed by it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It was an internal fight. I want you to forget what happened and have things magically go back to normal. But the more I try, the more I was buried in it. It was that by my own strength, I couldn't do anything. It was the Holy Spirit work. I had to become broken before God and surrendered this heavy burden to Him because after a few months, it was too heavy to carry. With the help of the people that God put around me, I began to understand the message that I had heard for years. And one day, I decided to forgive. I decided to give up this burden, and I was freed from the chain that was dragging me down. And now, how do I know that I truly forgave? Because now when I think about the situation, it doesn't torture me anymore. It is a memory that I can erase it, but it doesn't continue to hurt me. From this experience, I have learned two pieces of advice that I can give to our church. They are written in the Bible in Mark 12, 29, 31. To love the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our minds, and with all our strengths. And the other is to love our neighbors as ourselves. Good morning, Church. I'm Bob Perlis. Cindy and I have been members for the last 23 years. We attend the third service and have had the privilege of being a head usher for the last 15 years. I'd like to give you my testimony. A 99% Ashkenazi Jew with Russian and Lithuanian lineage. My father is a Jewish baker. I was born in Brooklyn, and I never saw the inside of a church, or a synagogue for that matter, until I was in my 20s. On graduating high school, I had a strong desire to find the truth, to find and appropriate those truths uh, that would help me. I, I'm building a compass of sorts to navigate a life full of contradictions and confusion. I want to know right from wrong a light unto my feet, in retrospect. By 1972, I had been in the service for four years, the Air Force. Uh, I'm married. I just got a degree in political science from UCSB with an emphasis on political philosophy. 
following my desire to find the truth. I found out that the, that the philosophers that I was studying, the teachers that I had, were not truth tellers. In fact, I, after some consideration, I, I found that they were possibly more confused than I was. By 1976, now I'm 30, uh, my career is being established at Raytheon. We just bought a new house. My best friend, Ted Podway, who's my best, best man at my wedding, would talk to me about Jesus Christ. My friends were leading me towards the church, and now I get a knock at the door. Well, it turns out to be the proverbial Revelations 320. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and sup with him and he with me. Well, these two, they were, who was knocking at the door were two uh, Mormon missionaries. And what they offered me was six lessons to go through the scriptures. Now, what I learned in the, in the Bible uh, was that, that the word was God. And uh, Jesus Christ was the word of God. And the whole Bible consisted of those words. The words that were most important to me were John 8, 31, 32. It says, Jesus told those Jews who believed in him that if you continue in my word, you will be my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Well, this is what I've been looking for. This is the truth I had been seeking. It was a fulfillment of my desires, and, I've, and at that time, a fulfillment of my prayers. Now, what the next steps were to find a Bible-believing church. We, we joined uh, the Goleta Federated Church with what was our faith parents and acquired a handful of wonderful friends and, start, and began to life in the Word, and in church, and in fellowship. Afterwards, I became a leader at, in my Bible studies at Raytheon, which lasted 20 of the 20, 20, 20 of the 23 years that I was there. Um, life's good in God. How did you end up at Free Methodist Church? Well... Um, my son, we were going to another church, and um, my son, Daniel, who was attending Free Methodist, said, Dad, can't we worship together? And it really struck uh, our hearts, and Cindy and I then quickly uh, talked to Danny and Cheryl, who are friends of ours, and we joined the church, um, and have been, been there ever since. Can you tell me what has kept you growing since you became a Christian? Well, that would be prayer. Uh, that intimate time with God where I could ask the tough questions and be supported in, in uh, his blessing of, of indwelling. Um, and to work out uh, those questions that I had, and he would provide answers and guidance and support. What has been the best part of your Christian life? Well, that would be the assurance that I have eternal life. And that I have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment of God in me. The other thing is, is, is my children and my wife, and they do deserve the best husband, and they deserve the best father. And it, it has helped me to grow in Christ. What has been the most challenging part of your Christian life? That would be defaulting to my flesh, to, to the human instincts and understandings that I have, rather than stopping and uh, being informed by the Word of God, uh, by, by the Holy Spirit, and what the, the path forward, the, the things that are right to do. What are a couple tips you would give our church about living for Christ? That would be to be joyous, as the Word says. Uh, this is the day the Lord hath made. Rejoice and be glad in it. And the other one would be is that don't let your faith and your walk be impeded by the 
mysteries of the faith, by the things that you don't know. Rather, hold fast to the hand of God and to Jesus Christ and run the race to its completion and ultimately into his arms. Hi, everyone. My name is TK Erickson, and I'm excited to share with you my faith journey today. I was born in a small rural village in southern Laos at the end of the Vietnam War. My father had joined the Laotian army when he was a boy and then fought with the Americans. When I was a few months old, my family decided we had to escape Laos. My father, my mother, my older sister and I fled across the Mekong River and we ended up in northeastern Thailand managing a silk farm. There when I was three years old, the Thai army came and arrested and transported my family to a refugee camp where we had lived for five years. And when I was in the refugee camp, my brothers were born. I had really great memories in terms of my involvement. I learned traditional Thai dancing and I also attended preschool and learned Laotian there. When I was seven years old, my family was sponsored by the Church of the Latter-day Saints and we came to the United States. We landed in St. Louis, Missouri, and during the first few months while we were there, I remember the Mormon missionaries would come to our home and they would have tea with my parents. And um, even though they couldn't communicate each other's language, but it was really, it was really important that they reached out to our family. And after that, my parents decided to move to Minneapolis, Minnesota. They actually um, knew some friends there and they had settled in Minneapolis because they um, had a lot of Lucian families there. And so during that time, I started learning English. I was going to school and learning English. And then my parents started working two jobs and it was pretty difficult. My my brothers and I were often left alone. My um, my time there was really difficult in the sense that I had to learn English quickly and then I became the translator for my family. And one of the best memories during that time for me was a neighborhood um, church member stopped by during Christmas and brought us bags of Christmas gifts. And it's the first time we received any toys and it was so precious that I didn't even open some of the gifts. Um, and then later, my parents wanted to move to a small, smaller town and we ended up moving to, moving from town to town. And then we ended up in Mountain Lake, Minnesota and that was a small Mennonite town of about 2,000 people. And there, across the street from us, there was an Assemblies of God pastor, and he reached out to our family. We got to know him and his family, and my parents um, really encouraged my brothers and I to go to church. And as we went to church and got to know his family, I developed a better understanding of what it means to be a Christian and to be saved by faith. During my high school year, I went to a church camp and I actually accepted Christ for the very first time. And I stayed involved in junior high and high school. And then one of the most critical years in my life was my junior year in high school. And that's when I got a chance to go to Germany on a full scholarship. That year in Germany, I relied on God and I learned um, to really adapt to a new culture and a new language. And there God provided for me with a wonderful host family and also um, many, many great friends. I returned from Germany my senior year and I was befriended by a math teacher and a former pastor. And 
He was very instrumental in helping me to navigate my college options. He presented me and encouraged me to look at Bethel University. And that's where I ended up. It was one of the best decisions of my life. I ended up meeting amazing people and making lifelong friends. Looking back at my life and my journey from Southeast Asia to the United States, there were always people of faith who looked out for me and helped me to navigate important life decisions, whether there be Mormon missionaries who welcomed us into the United States the first few months, or an Assemblies of God pastor who welcomed us into the church family, or a neighborhood um, church member who brought us bags of Christmas toys to my brother and I in Minneapolis, or my host families, um, my admissions counselor, or my college friend's parents. These were really important people in my life. One of my callings in my life is to befriend and welcome people who are outsiders. One of the ways I try to live this out is by working with high school and college students, specifically first generation and underrepresented students to access and succeed in higher education. And that is the condensed version of my testimony. And I'd be more than happy if you have any questions to share with you my story. And hopefully I'll be able to share with you in person. Thank you for listening to my story.
Thank you so much, Christine, Donald, Bob, and TK. We are honored that you would share your story with us. May God continue to be exalted in your lives. May God continue to be exalted in all of our lives. What is your story? What do you have to say about how God has met you? I encourage you this week to find somebody who doesn't know your story. Find someone who doesn't know the living God and tell them how it is that you know he's alive, that you have experienced him firsthand. And if you have not had that experience, we invite you to call a pastor or to call someone who you know has that experience so that you can talk with them because God is drawing you close to him. This morning, our benediction comes from Romans 15, and it says this, May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that through the power of the Holy Spirit, God's hope might abound in you. Oh, what a good word from the Apostle Paul. May the hope of Christ abound richly in all of us. Amen. Thank you.